I tell you, I love this venue. You need one of these. These are really helpful. I, 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 this is very cool. So, uh, look, I'm bringing up, I'm bringing up the, the rear of this thing, as we say, uh, bringing up the closing session. I've got about three, three and a half hours of just some really deep teaching. And I know you guys are excited. And uh, I've got some charts and graphs they are going to pass out in a little bit. But, uh, no, I just want to share with you just a few minutes before we go. I'm always given the kind of the uh, task with giving the story behind uh, uh, ARC. Uh, sometimes I'm kind of known as the resident historian in ARC. Don't know why that is, but I do know that I love stories, and uh, stories are good. I do actually have a South Africa story. Uh, just as a side note, uh, I went up on Table Mountain last time I was here and got a kidney stone. I've never had that before, and those are uh, really something. And um, I was wearing sunglasses, and uh, I really started to cry. And Will, uh, who's traveling with me, uh, was getting pictures because I was laying on some rocks, you know, kind of like this. And he just saw me from the back, and he said, man, Mike is really posing there, you know. And, he's, and I was just over there crying, you know. But uh, the Lord brought me through. He claims that towards the end of the season of pain there, when I was in the hospital, I had a little surgery done the next morning and then caught a flight back, which is a long flight, by the way. But he claims I was turning over everything, giving him the keys, telling him to tell my wife that I love her and tell the guys in China that I love them and tell the guys in Japan I love them and all that. And, but uh, anyway, but it was great. And so I couldn't wait to get back. I love this Love this country. So, but I do love stories and because I think they reflect the destiny. They reflect the purpose of God. We see the stories on a local level. We see it on the ground level. Uh, but God uh, sees it from much higher. And I'm always amazed at the things that go into making something happen. And I think that's the thing I love about my own, my own uh, connection with Jesus uh, I was really in a place of darkness, uh, but I was a happy guy in my place of darkness. I had no desire for the Lord. Uh, I was just in, living it up in my own state, and yet God saw that I had a call to be a pastor one day. And it's so phenomenal that I would be in dark places, and yet he would see that, and he would begin to orchestrate things to make that happen. And so he did, and he I was really one to the Lord relationally, but but this this guy just became a friend to me. And we went hunting, and we went fishing, and we just drank coffee, and we just hung out together. And after about three months, I realized how much I wanted Jesus, and I got born again. But I'm just always impressed with the process that he has to get us to where he does. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is is uh, Acts chapter 10. And you have, you have Peter over here in uh, Joppa up on the roof, and he's getting a little conflicted about a vision he has. And then you have Cornelius over here. Uh, that, that he's, he's got his family gathered together, and they both have some things that God is speaking to them about. And yet God brings it all together, and it was destiny. Do you know what I'm saying? And so that's one of the things I, I, I always like to uh, – I shared a little of this last time I was here, but – I just love to share a little bit of how this comes together because I just don't think it's an American thing. I think it's a kingdom thing. And uh, it may transpose different. It may be some, some different things, but I think the principles are kingdom. And I think the thing about stories is that what God does in one situation, uh, he may do totally different in another but it's still the hand of the Lord, the Holy Spirit moving things. I sense the Lord in this room. I just sense the Lord in this gathering is what I'm trying to say. I sense the destiny. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, just, I feel like the Lord is doing something. I think we see a little bit of it right now. But I think that's why I'm trying to say if we could back up to about 30,000 feet, we would probably be amazed at the things he's setting in place because he loves this country that much. He loves Africa this much. He, his hand is on it. So I, I'm, I'm going to let him put up a few pictures. I always like to put up this first picture of, uh, of the original six 
uh, these guys. It'll be, there you go. Look at these handsome fellas. The six guys plus Gail. And so I always like to highlight this because here are six guys. You, we've, we've heard from Greg Surratt, Pastor Greg, early on. Then Dino Rizzo, then Billy Hornsby, who went to be with the Lord about five years ago. He led ARC for the first 10 years. Chris Hodges, that you heard from yesterday. Rick Bizet, who uh, planted at the same time as Chris Hodges. And then Scott Hornsby, uh, uh, who is under Billy's picture, and uh, he was on the team as well. Gail was over there transcribing. And I always think this is, this is interesting because these guys got together. There was no big world headquarters. There was nothing except a dream, which is the same way church planting works. When you go to plant a church, you don't have a building, you don't have a church, you don't have a play area for the kids. You just have a dream in your heart. So these guys are just talking, and they're talking about, man, what could this be like if we put something together like this? And they strategized. And Gail over there, uh, but Gail on the side, yeah, there she is. Uh, Gail is taking notes. And the way, the way it goes is they, they talked and they talked, and then they said, nah, that won't work. And she took the paper and wadded it up and threw it away. And they say, let's do it this way. <laughs> and they went on and on. And I th the point of that is they wanted to be very intentional to not create something that had uh, uh, that, that was hampered, that had uh, a lot of controls. They said, how can we make this thing uh, a wineskin to where it can grow? And so these guys, and I want to say one other thing about this picture. These are all leaders, but they're leaders because now we know they're leaders. I think, Pastor Greg, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but your church w in, in 2000 was maybe about 2,000 people. Dino's was probably four or 500 maybe. Uh, Billy was uh, working with you, so he didn't have a church. Chris did not have a church. Rick did not have a church. And Scott had a church of maybe two, 200, something like that. So, it, so a lot of times we think, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of times we, we, you know, we, we maybe despise small beginnings and we think, oh, we, we got to whatever. But here's this, this group of guys, but there was a dream in their heart. And so as, as this thing happened, first year, uh, Two churches were planted, Chris Hodges and Rick Bizet, and they planted those first two churches. And then the second year was three churches. And then the third year was five churches. So now how many is that a total of so far? I think it's 10. I may be wrong. So let's say 10 anyway. So t <laughs> I think it's 10. 10 churches in three years. That's great. But now we compare with where we are now, and we think, oh, that was very small. I'm just saying two churches, first conference, 35 people at the conference. Everybody was high-fiving, not 350 like that's, that's been here, 35 people, and they were thrilled because they knew God's hand was on it. You know what I'm saying? So I look at this, a room of, of 350 people, and... and I'm thinking, wow, look at the hand of the Lord. Look at what God is doing. Yeah. So this, uh, 16 years later, now we're planting 140 churches this year. Is that not mind-blowing? Just incrementally. It just started, and it started multiplying. 93% of those churches are still going after five years. I love that. 93%, and I'm telling you, let me tell you this, and then I'm going to tell you the principle behind why I think this will work here as well. We can plant 140 churches this year, and we have never run out of money. Never. Run. We have never had a church planter that came to us, and he, was, and he jumped through the hoops, and we said, mm, things are real tight right now. I don't think we're going to be able to help you. We have always been able, and I don't think it's an American thing. I think it's a kingdom thing. And I'm going to give you some principles in just a minute. Look, I want Will, Will Johnson to come up. Will is, uh, yeah, let's give Will a hand. Grab a mic, Will. Now, again, I'm telling you, I give you the, I give you the, 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 the 30,000 foot view. But now here's a guy 
now that is affected by ARC churches whose life has been changed through an ARC church. Give us, give us your story. Uh, yeah, so, hey, how's everybody doing, by the way? It's amazing to be here. I love South Africa so much. This the is people, uh, his second time as well. Yeah, second time. The people, the culture, the landscape. Just don't take this for granted because we don't have it in Birmingham. I'm letting you know now. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, I, I grew up in church. I'm from this uh, small city called Knoxville, Tennessee. You guys probably haven't heard of it. Um, it's near the Smoky Mountains, uh, Gatlinburg. You might have heard of like Dolly Parton or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's where I'm from. And I went to this Baptist church. I mean, my parents had us in church every single Sunday. And um, I had a real relationship with God through that early on, but I did, um, for most of my life, struggle with the love for the church because it was steeped in religion and tradition and uh, church face and people coming and acting like on Sunday everything in their home was perfect and then going home and living this totally different private life. Um, and my family was one of those. My parents fought all the time, um, verbally, you know, very abusive and uh, not towards us, but just in, in arguments with each other. And it was tough to see that. And then walk into church on Sunday, you know, smile and wave and say, oh, yeah, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah. And um, it actually got to the point when I was 14 where my parents split up and got a divorce. My dad moved to another city. Me and my mom went and lived in this other side of town. Um, I had to start over almost in a way at 14 and make new friends. It was in high school. And I just said, you know what, God, I love you, but I've, I've struggled with the church for a little while. I think I might try and figure life out without it, do it on my own. And who knows quickly, you know, that's where you start sliding off into other areas. I surrounded myself with the wrong kind of people, partied for about four years, and then at 18, I look up and I go, man, I'm completely empty. <laughs> like, how did I get to this point in life? And uh, I actually called a friend of mine up who lived that exact same lifestyle as me, raised in the same church, um, and had ran from God. And uh, the last time I'd seen him, he's like my best friend, but he was a drug dealer. He had been selling weed and a few other things. And uh, I was like, hey, man. Um, you know, I'm graduating high school. I'm not happy with the way life is going. I know how we both have been living, and, like, I just want to talk to you about it. I've been thinking about giving God another shot, um, getting back in church, but I don't want to go back to the church we grew up in. And he says, whoa, man, that's crazy. Um, and I'm thinking he's still living this lifestyle, and his response to me was, I'm actually on my way driving to go meet my pastor right now. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what in the world? And he starts telling me about this church. He's like, man, bro, it's totally changed my life. You got to come check it out. It's phenomenal. Um, as Paul Van Collar would say, phenomenal. And uh, yeah, I went and it, from the time I walked in the door, was drastically different from anything I'd ever seen in church before. Um, I didn't know what ARC was at the time, but I knew this church was different and I knew that the people passionately loved Jesus. The pastor was wearing like skinny jeans and this you know, denim jacket with a t-shirt on stage, and I'm like, what in the world? This guy actually looks like me. There's not people walking around in suits everywhere, and uh, there were younger people that, like, would come up and talk to me and, you know, share some of the stuff that they were going through in life and made me feel welcomed and at home, and the next thing I knew, I was plugged into this church and serving and giving my life to the house of God, and I was there for three years. Um, half of that was as a volunteer staff member, um, and I just... I'm so thankful for churches like that. I know there's a lot of young people in here. Make some noise if you've been a part of a church like that before. You're thankful that Woo! there are people that have been willing to kind of challenge the way, the tradition that church has done um, to get the message of the gospel out there to young guys like me. And so I went from there to Birmingham, Alabama and spent two years um, in a school pretty similar to uh, Hillsong College. It's called Highlands College, um, two-year program. And I did student ministry while I was there. Um, and then also... Got to intern with Michael at ARC just through a God opportunity um, simultaneously. And so uh, now I'm here with him on the team full time. Um, after I graduated, I, I really thought I was going to be a youth pastor. And God told me to stay in Birmingham. Um, and it just really was miraculous that I ended up on the team with him. So, yeah. Let's give Will a hand. Good yeah. job, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. That was ARC plant number 17 that he connected with and came back to the Lord. Isn't that great? Now, art plant number 111 is a guy out of Pastor Greg's church. This guy used to attend, uh, Pastor Greg to, used to attend Seacoast. And uh, his parents were going through a divorce. Some mornings before he would get to church, he would smoke weed get just, just to endure 
and he and now he's planted a church in Colorado with two campuses doing great number 117 and I can go on and on and on with stories so grateful we're, we're gonna play a video in just a minute of uh, the the lady from Swaziland that that they've planted her pastor was I believe uh, church number 163 so God does an incredible thing. I want to give you, real quickly, I want to give you four things that we focused on as an organization that kept this thing in the middle of the road, that kept this thing moving forward. And these are real simple, but I can't tell you how important these four things are. Number one, uh, we really, really made it about relationships. We really made it about relationships. These six guys that I, that, that I had a picture of early on decided amongst themselves, even before they got to the church planting mission, they said, we know our strengths, we know our weaknesses, and let's just do the rest of our life together. Let's just believe in each other. We know people on the outside of this room may think we're big stuff or little stuff. We know who we are. Let's be friends. So now with every, we'll have a training, a church planner, a gathering of church planners to come to be trained every, every month and a half to two months. And when they walk in that room, it's a culture. And when they walk in that room, they start connecting with each other. So the first thing is about relationships, and here's how it affects culture. You remember uh, yesterday we talked about culture, that culture is not something you create. It is who you are. And so what it results in is, it, is that art became a culture of authentic friendships and healthy ministry. Now, regardless what you walk out of the room and do or how, who you connect with, could I just encourage you in this first point? And I feel like uh, Pastor Pierre uh, talked about that. Pastor Graham talked about that. Healthy ministry, it comes through authentic relationships. And if you don't have that, then you don't get a culture of a healthy ministry. Everybody with me? Relationships are huge. Relationships, I'm going to tell you something you know relationships take investment. I will go to an event like this and I will see somebody and I'll just feel a connection. I say, man, let's share numbers. Let's, let's talk again. This is great. And then I go away and if I don't call them and they don't call me, there is no relationship there. I admire them. But the relationships that are of significance in my life are the ones that I'm intentional to text or call or FaceTime or whatever that looks like. So they take an investment. It's not a huge, it, 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 it just takes, it takes an investment. Second thing, this is important. This is what helped ARC, and I think it's a kingdom principle that will work here. We created a self-sustaining business model. So here's the deal. We never give church planners money. We put some money in their hands, but we say we'd like it back to give to the next guy. We have never given away a dime, but what it means is that the thing can just keep going. Now, that is huge because you're, what you're doing is you're creating something instead of just a handout. Here's something. And you give them a little bit, and then the next guy comes along, we give him a little bit, but you know it's a, a limited pot, so you can only give out so much, and then it starts shrinking. And what it, in, what, what it prohibits you from doing is actually being generous long term. You think you're generous because you're giving it away. But if you say, look, let me help you get this church off the ground in your greatest time of need, and then let's give that to the next guy once you get going. And so here's what results is the culture, is it becomes a culture of effective generosity. So we put some, we, 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 we give them some money. They're going to need to buy equipment, so we believe in them. 
the amount that you give here in South Africa, I think, is less relevant, the exact dollar amount. At one point, we, we funded them a third of what their church, plant or church plant would cost, and then they would go raise the rest. Now we do up to a half. It might be 10 or 20 percent, whatever that number is, you want to be able for everybody that's ready to plant a church, you want to come alongside their dream. They got a dream. If you came up to me and I have a dream to go do something and you said, Michael, I want to do that. I want to get involved in that. <sighs> Man, my head swells. I mean, I'm feeling good about myself. Somebody believes in, in me enough that they want to do that. Imagine that we get, got to do that 140 times this year to come along a couple with a dream and say, hey, love that. Hey, you want to go to Cincinnati, Ohio? Come on, let's do it. Hey, you want to go to New York City? You got it. He says, well, I, I'm thinking I might go to Seattle. Great. Hey, here's some money. You want to be able to, everybody tracking with me? Third thing is we delivered, we developed a proven model for church planning. We developed a proven model. Now, the model always gets tweaked, but our model is about building a team, having some money to buy some equipment, and starting at a certain date. So the opposite of our model is to say, I'm going to go start tonight. I'm going to get me a Bible study, and we're going to have it in my home, and we're going to get going. Hey, Jesus can plant his church any way he wants to, so we're not dissing that at all, okay? But our model is we can help you learn how. So we don't approach the doctrine side. You, you get that on your own. You need that. You need the Bible, the, the Bible training. You get that on your own. You get that in the local church where you're a part. So we're going to move on over here to the real practical side of how this thing works. And we're going to give you, uh, we're going to give you some tools. We're going to coach you. We're going to show you how this thing comes together. We're going to show you how to build a team. We're going to tell you about how to, the way to approach fundraising. We're going to tell you about how to get that first service going, about where to buy some equipment. We're going to coach you all the way through it. Here's, what, here's, here's the culture that is a result of it. It brings a culture of, I can do this. If you have so many models that nobody knows which end is up. If you try to be everything to all people, then you end up with nothing really that people can hang their hat on. You want something that can be replicated. We are not the only thing out there. We have one lane that we run in, but we run in it pretty, pretty good. It's the lane God has given us, and I believe I believe a lot of those same principles could work here. And so if you put that together, you contextualize it, you make it fit your own culture, but then you say, this is our model, then you put things out there and it becomes proven. That doesn't, I mean, <laughs> church, a church planner has got to be a leader, but our model includes the, even the, the assessment of them. And so we get, all of these, we, get, we get all of these things in place. Then lastly, we designed a process to select, train, and coach people that were ready to start strong. When, 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 whenever we go to a, another country, and, they, and, and there's been uh, six or eight of them now that, that are in different levels of starting an arc in their country, whenever they first put a sign up and say, hey, we're doing this, people start lining up. Well, I want to do that. Well, I want to do that. I want to do that. You almost immediately have to say, oh, man, we got to have a process here. And so we have figured out that you've got to know when people are in a healthy place, when they're ready. And we have a process for that. But here's the culture that comes about of it. It creates a culture of strength. Those things are so important, and I believe those same principles will work here. Now, there's a video that I wanted to show of, of uh, Paul Andrew. I want you to watch this. Again, uh, Pastor Paul planted in New York City in Manhattan, 
and he now has, I believe, three campuses in the city, I believe two in, in Manhattan and one in Brooklyn, New York City, and then uh, one in Swaziland. They're about to plant one in uh, San Francisco. And, uh, uh, but I, I, want you to, I want you to just listen to his story. Do you guys have that video ready? standing on the, at the feet of the Statue of Liberty, looking out over the city, and as clear as I've ever heard the Holy Spirit, instead he just asked me a question. And he said, what would you give for a city? I said, I'll give everything. I'll give everything. And the moment I said that, two things came to mind. One was he said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains but one. And the second thing I heard him say was, the generations will call you blessed. And I remember just thinking about the generational impact of the decisions that we make, not just the tactical and the here and now, but this sense that we had the opportunity to press into something that wouldn't be easy and it'd be worth it, you know, for the sake of generations. city is an amazing city. It's a city full of diversity uh, with many people groups. Uh, it's a place of influence and power. So I wanted to come to a place where the base of influence nationwide could be influenced. Because whatever happens in New York, it literally affects our nation and nations of the world. And what not better place to do that than in New York City? There's something really powerful when you have diversity and unity. I mean, uh, Psalm 133 talks about how blessed it is when God's people dwell together in unity. And, and so I think there's power um, when, when we don't ignore those differences, but when we celebrate those differences and press into the chaos that comes with understanding each other from all of our different points of view. Um, and then we come together under one name, you know, as one people. Uh, and celebrate with one voice. I mean, that, that, there's something powerful. I think heaven's going to be like that, isn't it? So, but we can experience, in some ways, a very tangible expression of that on earth in places where that humanity is concentrated together. If God ends up calling more people here, we can change the culture. And I do believe God is speaking to a lot of people. New York is getting on the forefront again of where people want to be. They want to be here. They want to sense that call and they want to make a difference. And so I'm believing that there's going to be hundreds of new churches planted in the next 10 years in New York Metro. And I believe in many of those are going to be art churches. They're going to create life-giving environments to make an impact in this region. Because we need more. We need more churches. We need more people that are called, battle-tested, and ready to do what God's called them to do. And we believe this is a great city to do it. What would you, uh, yeah, it's, uh, look, what I do love is, is that phrase, what would you give for a city? What would you give for a city? I want to read uh, one verse. I'm going to close in just a minute, but I'd like them to put up the verse. It's from Isaiah chapter 42 and verse, uh, verses 1 and the following, and it's from the, the, from the message paraphrase, Isaiah chapter 42. It's kind of a long one, so I'm going to look. Let's see if we can get that up. There we go. Uh, all right. So it says, uh, now this, this passage, we know it's a prophetic word about Jesus. But I believe it's also a prophetic word about what God is raising up in his Jesus followers. It says, take a good look at my servant. I'm backing him to the hilt. He's the one I chose, and I couldn't be more pleased with him. I've bathed him with my spirit, my life. He'll set everything right among the nations. He won't call attention to what he does. 
with loud speeches or gaudy parades. He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt, and he won't disregard the small and the insignificant. But he'll steadily and firmly set things right. He won't tire out and quit. He won't stop until he's finished his work. Think about that for just a minute. He says, oh, he says, this is a guy that I am backing to the hilt. I know that's about Jesus, but I I'm seeing, I see in my heart, and I believe you do too. I think it's in this room. I'm seeing that same thing that God says, this is, this is my kid over here. This is my couple over here in Swasi land. I love this couple. I'm so pleased with them. I tell you, I think that's a word for some of you in here. God says, I'm backing you to the hilt. I got your back. I'm so incredibly proud of you. Now, here's the place. I can get that from the word. I can get that in prayer a little bit. But do you know where I really get that? It's from somebody else that comes up and says that to me. It's, a nice, it's nice when I read this and I say, man, God's probably saying that about me. But then my brain says, yeah, but he, you ain't all that in a bag of chips. I doubt he really thinks that. Yeah, he likes you, okay. But when somebody comes up to me and says, man, Michael, I know that wasn't the best word, the, be the, the best message you've ever preached, but I tell you, God is really proud of you. And I'm telling you, God has, some, God has a generation in South Africa and throughout this continent. He has men and women that he is raising up. Some of them don't even know the Lord yet. You may have a son or daughter that's in that place. But I, God has a generation that he's raising up. And I'm telling you, and he says they won't ignore the hurting he says, I've got my hand on them. They're going to set things right. And I'm telling you, they're out there. They're out, they're out here in this, in this nation. In the United States, here's, here's my little thing that I just live by. And Pastor Greg gave some stats earlier where he talked about uh, a church for every 450 people and then a church for every 950 and so forth. My dream is that at least one out of every 1,000 people in our church planting age has a call to plant a church. I think God has that. I think, I think somehow there are people that are marked and destined and called to plant a church, and some of them are still in the bars and the clubs and the dark places, but God says, my hand is on them, and I got a purpose. I have a destiny for them. Now, in the United States, there are 350-something million people our church planting age is typically 25 to 45. Sometimes we'll plant some a little older, but that's kind of the age. There are 80 million people in the United States that are in that age group. That means if there's one out of every thousand that have a call to do something significant for God, there's 80,000 of those walking around the United States at any given moment. In the United States, in the African-American community in the United States, there are 10,000 of them walking around the United States at any given moment. So that's where my heart is drawn to. I'm thinking, what are they going to do? Before ARC started, there was not a lot out there. Pastor Chris talked yesterday about how there just wasn't much, to, there wasn't much training on that. They learned what they did from, from, from Greg Surratt. But then we began to set a table. We said, man, we gotta, we gotta set out some, we gotta set out some relationships, some friendships there. We gotta put some training on that table. Could we put some money on that table to help them? Could we put some coaching on that table to help? Them? And we began to set the table, and when we did, they started coming. Now we have, when, when, when we look at the website of those who have started the process with us, sometimes we'll have five to seven to ten a day that go online and start the process with us in ARC. That's at least 2,500 a year. That means over the last even five or six years, we have uh, impacted in some way 15 to 20 percent of the 80,000 that are walking around with a call. 
We don't have to plant all 80,000. We're not cut out for that. We don't have the capacity for it. We're not supposed to do that. We're not the only thing out there. We just are supposed to do the ones that God has given us. So I always go to South Africa. And, uh, and, and so South Africa has a population of around 50. I'm, I'm going to throw out 56 million people. That means in this nation there are 15,000 with a call to plant a church. Are you supposed to reach all of them? No. But what if you did set a table and just reach the ones God gives you? And I just feel there's enough strength in this room. I feel there's enough. I believe in this room that, that, that many of you, you're in a good place in your life. You may be stressing a little about your church, wishing it were doing a little more, but you are a father. You're a mom. And I'm telling you, you could speak those same words that God spoke in Isaiah 42. And you could proclaim those same things. Pa uh, Pastor Graham just spoke about that a few minutes ago, and Pierre and so forth. You could speak those words and look at them in the eye and say, I'm incredibly proud of you. I'm incredi incredibly proud of you. And I believe as you do, God's beginning, God sees the gold in them. They're covered with dirt right now. They're covered with mud. You can't see it on the outside, but I'm telling you, there are church planters in this nation. And if we can get that junk off of them, I'm telling you, God's going to let his gold come out. Everybody tracking with me? So I just, I just want you to know, ARC in the U.S., we're very proud of you. We believe God's hand is on you. We believe God's hand is on the leadership. We believe there's strength in this nation. We're not bringing a model into this nation that we say, hey, here's the American thing. Now go take it. It'll work here. We're giving you principles, and then you take that, and you make it your own. But let's believe for it. Let's believe. Are you guys good with that? Everybody cool with that? Is that all right? I think that's the end. Come on up. <laughs>